Qualifications for Leadership When we select leaders for the church, we are to focus on internal spiritual qualities. And that is in contrast to what we see in the Old Testament, because the focus in the Old Testament was on external qualities. Now there's a reason for that. For one reason, they didn't have any internal qualities. <laughs> Those were beginning to develop, and it's amazing how God used people in spite of their weaknesses, their sins. You see that throughout the book of Judges, where God just revealed Himself, and uh, He chose people, even uh, people like Samson, uh, the judges, uh, even a man like Gideon, and you look at their lives, they were living really in idolatry, and many times God just chose them to be a leader. And He didn't choose them, choose them based upon their internal qualities. But once you get to the New Testament, you have a whole different perspective. Now let's go back to Leviticus, and you'll see the emphasis on external qualities. The Lord spoke to Moses, tell Aaron, none of your descendants throughout your generation who has a physical defect is to come near to present the food of his God. In other words, as much as humanly possible, uh, these priests were to be individuals who did not have any uh, malformities. Uh, they were to be as perfect as possible without physical defect, like blindness or hearing problems or other problems with limbs, this type of thing. And so uh, here we have uh, a statement of that. Moving on. Uh, a little bit further in uh, verses 23-24, but because he has a defect, he must not go near the curtain or approach the altar. He is not to desecrate my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord who sets them apart. And by the way, that's a very significant word. God set them apart. Regardless of their internal qualities, He set them apart based on their external qualities. Moses said this to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites. And then, of course, if you go to uh, verse 9, uh, we read this, "...they must keep My instructions, or they will be guilty and die because they profane it. I am the Lord who sets them apart." I mean, this is serious business. And so God is selecting these individuals. Now, the interesting thing is that, that this physical uh, wholeness applied to animals, the sacrifices. It had to be a lamb without blemish. And that was external, and obviously here with the priests and the Levites who served, they would be selected based upon these physical qualities. The interesting thing is, and let me give you a summary statement. From an external point of view, Jesus Christ would not have qualified to be a priest in Israel, according to the specifications outlined in Leviticus. Yet, today He sits at the right hand of God as our mediator and intercessor. Today Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God, and we're not sure. I've been thinking a lot about that lately as I've been praying and thinking in my mind, there's, there's Jesus in this physical form sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is hard to even conceive of because God is Spirit. He's everywhere. And when we pray, Jesus is that mediator that is representing us to the Father because of His perfect sacrifice in spite of the fact that He was bruised and bleeding and He has those nail prints in His hands and will have throughout all eternity. When we see Jesus Christ, we'll be able probably to see those nail prints. He is not going to have a perfect body in the sense of without blemish. It'll be a glorified body, but those nail prints will probably still be there. At least uh, I think that's, that's probably what will happen. We know that uh, when He arose from the grave and He appeared to Thomas in His glorified body, He said, come and put your fingers in the nail prints. Put your hand in My side. Now the point I'm making is that even Jesus Christ would not have been qualified to serve as a priest in Israel. Uh, he was bruised and bleeding. Uh, and in Isaiah, if you want to read a, a, uh, an incredible graphic presentation of what He looked like, Isaiah 53, 2, He had no form or splendor that we should look at Him, no appearance that we should desire Him. And you, you see a picture of Jesus Christ in His imperfections when He went to the cross, and particularly when He died for the sins of the world. 
Now that's interesting. The other interesting thing I want to point out to you is that the Apostle Paul, who was a great apostle of the Gentiles, would have been disqualified from being a great missionary and a great apostle if he were chosen based on his perfections. We read uh, in, in Galatians 6.17, From now on let no one cause me trouble, because I carry the marks of Jesus on my body. And what's he talking about? Well, if you read in, in uh, 2 Corinthians particularly, he was beaten five times with forty lashes minus one. Uh, he was bruised, he was bleeding, he was stoned and left for dead. Uh, he probably had blemishes in his eyes because uh, we think that might have been his thorn in the flesh uh, that he asked the Lord to remove and God said, My grace is sufficient for you. And uh, in one place he said, You'll see with what large letters I sign this document, this letter. He would dictate the letter. He'd have a stenographer who would take it down. But he couldn't even see what was written because of his eyesight, probably. So, um, Here's a man, a great man of God, who was not physically um, perfect. He would not have qualified to be a priest in Israel. Interesting, uh, interesting difference, isn't it? So you come to the New Testament, you have a whole new concept which emphasizes the internal, not the external. And there, there's a principle that we stated from 1 Timothy. And it comes from chapter 3 particularly, and the principle is this, that leaders who are appointed to serve in shepherding roles in the church are to be selected based on a comprehensive biblical criteria for measuring Christian maturity. And that biblical criteria is not based on externals. It's not based on our physical appearance. It's based on our internal qualities. It's based upon our character. And so you see a whole different perspective now that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, was resurrected, were born again, able to uh, serve Him based upon a changed heart. And so consequently, God requires that those of us who are spiritual leaders on the New Covenant manifest certain qualities that are very significant and very important to be a spiritual leader. That profile, let me just run through uh, the passage, particularly 1 Timothy chapter 3. And you have 15 qualities there. And if you go to Titus, you have some additional qualities. But let me just walk you through these very quickly. For example, above reproach means having a good reputation. And that good reputation is not based upon what we look like physically. It's based upon what we look like in our hearts. And one of the most important qualities that we're to reflect as a spiritual leader is second principle as a spiritual leader is moral purity. It simply means being a man of one woman. It means being morally pure, not guilty of, of sexual immorality. And that's interesting because that is a very significant reflection of who we are in terms of character. Number three, we are to be self-controlled, balanced in words and actions. That's not a physical quality. That's an internal quality that is reflected through the way we speak, the way we talk, the way we relate to people. Uh, another quality uh, is sensible, wise, humble. Again, you have an internal quality. Uh, number five, uh, respectable, uh, a, good, uh, a good role model. Respectable comes from a Greek word, uh, kosmios, which, which is a word from which we get the English word uh, cosmetics. Our lives would be like cosmetics to the gospel, kosmios. Kosmeo is the verb. Uh, that is used, uh, which sometimes is translated to adorn. Our lives are to adorn the gospel. That means being respectable, making the gospel look good to people because of the way we live. Number six, uh, hospitable. Uh, these are all stated there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 for the selection of spiritual leaders, which means unselfish. It means that we're generous. Number seven, uh, an able teacher, more aptly uh, actually translated, I think, uh, able to teach, a, a capacity to communicate sensitively. It's not talking about our method as much as it is the spirit in which we communicate. And that's a powerful internal quality. Um, number eight, we're not to be addicted to wine, not addicted to any substances, obviously, 
not to be controlled by these external substances. Number nine, uh, not a bully, <laughs> uh, not abusive. And you know, you can be abusive, not just with your fists, but with your words. You can tear people apart uh, with your words. You can leave them really in a state of utter despair uh, just with words. And, and so consequently, we are to be uh, people who are sensitive in our language and when we communicate, and certainly not physically abusive. Number 10, uh, gentle. And these, of course, are elaborating on, on what we've just looked at, being sensitive, loving, kind. Number 11 uh, is not quarrelsome, not argumentative, not divisive. You see an inner relationship here in these qualities. It's not just you're this and this and this and this, but you're this and this and this, and they're all interrelated, which is really a reflection of Jesus Christ and who He really is. And, and that is to be what we're to be like. And these are goals for every Christian, but especially if we're going to be a spiritual leader in the church. Uh, so number 12 is not greedy, not materialistic. Um, number 13, uh, manages his, his own household competently. That's a, how you shepherd, how you lead as a good husband, as a father, if, if indeed you're married. Number 14 is uh, not to be a new convert. That is, to be a seasoned Christian, a mature Christian, one who's learned over the years. Number 15, uh, a good reputation even among unbelievers. And so, uh, you know, as even unbelievers look at who we are as spiritual leaders, from the way we live our lives, we develop a good reputation. Not just with those in the church, but those outside the church. Now you say, you know, that's an incredible high standard. It is. But these are really goals for every Christian. And this is how we develop that good reputation, these qualities of life. And those are goals that we will really have for our lives the rest of our life until Jesus takes us home and conforms us totally into His image. So what we, have, uh, what we have here in the New Testament is an emphasis on the internal, not the external. Now you say, why the difference? Well, where was God going to find individuals in the Old Testament who reflected these qualities? Basically, there weren't any. Even Moses was not one of those men. God chose Moses in 40 years as a, as a growing up in Egypt. Uh, in some respects, some say he learned to be somebody. At least he thought he was. And then 40 years in the wilderness to learn to be nobody, to the place where he was humbled. And then another 40 years for God to use him through what he learned in the first 80 years. So God had, and even when God chose him, God took him through a, an incredible process of growth. And you see that in his life throughout, uh, about, uh, throughout his career as a leader in Israel. Uh, so God had to equip these men on the run, as it were. He couldn't wait to find mature individuals. He had to begin with what he had. And you see that all the way through the Old Testament. And of course, obviously, there were men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and uh, men of, of character, but they're few, they were few and far between. So basically, God was establishing and setting the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ so that we really know what maturity is, and Jesus reflected that maturity, and this profile is really a reflection of Jesus Christ, which is a lifetime process of being set apart, as it were, for uh, ministry and serving, or as a Christian, because these are goals really for every Christian.